Hallelujah. Barak, your name, Father Yahuwah. Come out of her, Mystery Babylon, is continuing in our study to find out what is this speaking of? Who is he telling us to come out of? Who is Mystery Babylon? You know, there's some different thoughts out there. But we got to look to scripture and we have to look to history. See what it tells us. So let's continue our journey. Hallelujah. A second Malkin followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all of the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Revelation 14, verse 8. The term Babylon occurs six times within scripture and has global significance. From the reference to all nations, and it depicted by Yehukanan as a particular center of idolatry. See, the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. Yahuwah remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Revelation 16, verse 19. Here, Babylon is identified with the great city, which is destroyed, creating a parallel with Revelation 11, 13. The judgment of Babylon is actually a very close parallel to the sin of Babylon mentioned in 14, verse 8. Though the English translations disguise this, the wine of the fury of her adultery is met with the wine of the fury of his wrath. And this parallel is an important expression of the justice of Yahuwah's judgment, for which Yahuwah is praised in Revelation 16, verse 7 and verse 18. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth, Revelation 17, 5. So once again, we find the association between Babylon the Great and the indication of global significance. Revelation 18, verse 2, the Malachim's mighty voice signifies universal hearing of the message and the reason for the, the fall parallels and expands the earlier anticipation from Revelation 14, verse 8, adding the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And the following command from the Moloch to Yahuwah's people to come out of her links to Yermiyahu's call in Jeremiah 51.45 to leave the historical place of exile as it faced Yahuwah's judgment and destruction. The next mention comes in the declaration of woe by the kings of the earth, Revelation 18.10. And this is paralleled by a similar refrain by the merchants and by the sea captains, though both of these simply refer to the great city. Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. Revelation 18, verse 16. Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has become brought to ruin. Revelation 18, verse 19. Babylon is thus depicted as a global power, one that prospered particularly through maritime trade, having client kings or kings of the earth who worked in partnership and whose trade led to the widespread prosperity of merchants. The repeated mention of pearls is also notable, and the vision of the great prostitute adorned with pearls and precious stones in chapter 17 is literally counterpoint to the description of the bride of the lamb, the Kadosh city built with precious stones and having pearly gates. If these were the only references to consider, then 
I don't think there would be any debate. The only cosmic trading seafaring power that uh, accrued enormous wealth to itself is Rome. And this fits with many other themes, ideas and images in the text. But the mention of the great city in Revelation 11, 8 brings a little confusion. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Mitzrayim, where also their Lord or their Adon was crucified. See, this verse is notable as containing the only explicit reference to Yahushua's crucifixion, and it illustrates the fate of the two witnesses. And so, argument goes, this great city was clearly Jerusalem. So this must give us the identity of Babylon. Yet this chapter is not talking about Babylon, but rather Jerusalem, figuratively being called Sodom and Mitzrayim, and the place of the two witnesses' appearance and death. Babylon, the Babylonian Empire was the first attempt at the one world government or the new world order, if you will. This human attempt at global governance through the use of dark knowledge, astrology, and pagan god worship was an abomination to Yahuwah. The Tower of Babel was a tower built not to reach up to Yahuwah, but rather as a massive structure from which to consult the stars through the use of astrology and communicate with the, the sun, Baal. See, Nimrod means tyrant, as he led the Babylonians to pay tribute to the skies, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, with the sacrifices of their children. The Tower of Babel, which was built for this purpose, among others, was, was echoed in other cultures, such as the Mitzrayim, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incas, in the form of the pyramid structures, all aligned with the sun and all built for the same purpose as the Tower of Babel. So Yahuwah intervened and confused the speech of the people of the earth and scattered them abroad. With the migration of the people coming out of Babylon, the sun-worshiping religion of Babylon was scattered throughout the earth. The names changed, but the religion remained the same. Since the languages now were confused, the names of Nimrod, Samarimus and Tammuz were changed and continued to change over time based on culture and language. Though the names changed, the religion remained exactly the same. Samarimus, however, became known as the Queen of Heaven, among other cultures, and worshipped as the primary head of this false religion. Even the children of Yasserel fell into the worship of Samarimus, the Queen of Heaven. And Yahuwah sent them the prophet Jeremiah Yahu with the following warning. But we will certainly do whatsoever things goes forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offering unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princesses in the city of Yehuda and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then... Had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offering unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. Jeremiah 44 verses 17 and 18. The following statue was originally a statue of Isis holding Horus, the Roman names for Samarimus, holding her son Tammuz, later known as Madonna and Child. Today, the statue, having been renamed Mary and Jesus, the latest incarnation of Samarimus and Tammuz, which you can see here with her holding this young child or this young man, I guess. This statue was renamed by the Roman Emperor Constantine to Mary with baby Jesus, and in the third century. Together, Samarimus and Nimrod, the bastard son of Samarimus named Tammuz, started this occult religion of sacrificing babies to Moloch, the false pagan sun god. 
The picture below is a depiction of children being sacrificed to the two-horned Alhim, Moloch. Still, even today, they do this. Obelisks were constructed as part of this religion, as phallic or male fertility symbols and interpreted as sun rays. We see these scattered throughout the world as well. These exact same pagan statues are echoed throughout our Christian nations. A massive obelisk sits in every uh, in the very center of St. Peter's Square of the Vatican, the birthplace in the capital of Christianity. In Rome, surrounded by occult symbols and figures and idols of pagan gods, which we see depicted here. We have an obelisk constructed in the heart of our own nation. We call it the Washington Monument. See, these obelisks to this day are found on the tops of Christian churches. We just call them steeples adorned with the cross of Tammuz, where the worship of the Trinity God on Sun God Day is worshipped. See, Nimrod, the king, took a wife. The wife Nimrod chose was his mother. So the son became both the husband and the son of the mother. In effect, making this marriage a trinity union in as much as the husband was the same person as the son, united as one with the wife or the mother. So Nimrod married his mother, Semiramis, and she became the queen of Babylon. It was Semiramis from which the religions surrounding Nimrod and the planets or astrology evolved. And Nimrod, the mighty and ruthless murderer, was killed for his crimes against humanity by the sons of Noah. His body cut into pieces and distributed all over his kingdom by his enemies. In the face of Nimrod's death, Semiramis had to somehow maintain her grip and power over the people. And in order to solidify her power, she invented a religion for the people that would keep Nimrod's control over them even after his death. She then gave birth to a son named Tammuz, whom she claimed was the reincarnation of Nimrod. So through the belief that Tammuz was Nimrod in the flesh, the queen was able to subdue the people of Babylon. Thus, Tammuz was Nimrod in the flesh and one with his father who was one with his mother and his wife through marriage. The unholy concept of a trinity is born here. See, this religion created in Babylon by Nimrod and Semiramis was making them rich as the people had to pay money to come into the temple to sacrifice their babies at the winter solstice, which is December 21st through the 25th. And also at Easter, Ishtar, if you will, sunrise service at the spring or vernal equinox, which we find in March 21st through the 25th. Every year on March 25th and December 25th, there would be a wild drunken party and orgies where virgins were impregnated by pagan priests. And since there are nine months to a pregnancy, and there are also nine months between March 25th and December 25th, the pagan priest of Baal, also known as the Lord, would impregnate these virgins on Easter Sunday. This was done to commemorate the impregnation of Semiramis with Tammuz. And then by the 25th, when these infants were newly born, they would then offer up these newborn babies on the altar to Moloch, Nimrod, if you will, on December 25th. A few months later on Easter Sunday, they would offer up more infants to the goddess named Ishtar, Easter today, the moon goddess Miramis. They would then take the blood of these sacrificed infants and dip eggs in them called Ishtar eggs. The Babylonian sun god Baal. See, Baal means the Lord and was the legendary Alhim of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, usually pictured as an opponent of Yahuwah in scripture. He was known by the Babylonians as Baal and was the leading uh, Alhim, a god of the Phoenicians, usually associated with Ashtoreth, Easter, if you will, in the Tanakh. He was also thought of as the son of the chief Canaanite god El, 
with Astra. Baal Berith, another of his names, means the Lord of the Covenant. The Hebrew word Baal or Baal actually means Lord, husband, or owner. The spirit always attempts to cause Yasserel to divorce or to break covenant with Yahuwah and to marry or align with this other Alhim. Consistent with this, in so many ways, America has broken covenant with Yahuwah and married Baal, which is known as the Lord and the God of fortune. The same Alhim of so many ancient pagan religions, this is the strong man behind most covenant breaking. He is a violent spirit and even requires human sacrifice. Abortion is under Baal as it is the cutting off of today's young generation. We can see this in 1 Kings 18.24. See, Baal is leading the fight to avert the, the great awakening plan for the young generation of the world today. Yahuwah will punish Baal in Babylon. And I will make what he has swallowed come out of his mouth. And the nations will no longer stream to him. Even the wall of Babylon has fallen down, according to Jeremiah 51, verse 44. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams that they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Jeremiah 23, verse 26 and 27. And in that day, declares Yahuwah, you will call me husband, and no longer will you call me Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. Hosea 2, verses 16 and 17. Dagon. In Babylon, the fish god came out of the Red Sea, or the Persian Gulf, half man and half fish and civilized the Babylonians. Dagon means the fish god. And when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, at first they placed it in their temple to Dagon as symbolic of the body captured in their victory over Yasserel and her Alhim. But the next day they found Dagon fallen on his face. They propped him up, but he had trouble staying up. The following day, they found him again face down, but this time with his hands and his head cut off, 1 Samuel 5, verses 1 through 4. It seems that Dagon didn't do too well with his rival Yahuwah, the Alhim of the Yasserel, that accompanied the ark. There were some accounts stating Baal was the son of Dagon and the descendant of El. Baal is placed on screen scriptures timeline as early as the 17th century BC. And recently, a majority of the scholars believe that Baal was the equivalent of the Canaanite Babylonian god named Marmaduke and the Assyrian god named Hadad. There was also the term Baal, a Semitic word that literally means lord or master, and was used in scripture to refer to the local idols. And it could also mean the master or the owner. This is the symbolic headgear and outfit that they used to represent this God. And we see this represented today in the Roman Catholic Church, the same attire, same outfit. Something's fishy with this religion for sure. Hallelujah. Babylonian Ishtar, Easter, if you will. The idol Ishtar from the Babylonian Empire is very likely what is spoken of by Yermiyahu, the prophet as the queen of heaven, which we find in Jeremiah 7, verse 18, 44, verse 16 through 19. See, Jeremiah 7, verse 18 says, The children gathered wood, and the fathers kindled the fire, and the woman knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other alhim, that they may provoke me to anger. So identifying this queen of heaven, looking up Jeremiah 7, verse 18, quoted above, in a couple of references, we find the following. The commentary of the uh, Ryrick Study Bible, the queen of heaven, the 
Asro Babylonian goddess Ishtar. In the commentary of the NIV study Bible, the Queen of Heaven, a Babylonian title for Ishtar, an important goddess in the Babylonian pantheon. And in the Unger's Bible dictionary, it says under the heading Queen of Heaven, Jeremiah 7, verse 18, as well as 14, verse 17, 19. Astarte, an ancient Semitic deity, identical with the Babylonian Ishtar, as well as Venus. So it's interesting to note that ancient Babylon's chief deity, Ishtar, a.k.a. Easter, held the very same title in Babylon, the mother of harlots. So let's take a look at the Babylonian Judaism. See, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in three stages from 605 to 586 BC, in which year the Temple of Solomon was demolished and the remaining Abris or Hebrews were carried into captivity. And during the Babylonian captivity, the prophet Ezekiel continued to reprove Yehuda for his apostrophe from the Alhim of Yasserel and their love affair with Babylon. From this history, we can see that Judaism is also included in this Babylonian system since they came out of Babylonian captivity and brought many Babylonian traditions and beliefs out with them, which makes them guilty of many of the same charges the Mashiach spoke against the Pharisees of his time, which would include not saying the name of Yahuwah, but instead calling him Adonai, or the, the, the Lord, if you will. The Pharisaic rabbinic traditions of the Babylonian Talmud are the written form of the traditions of the Pharisees. So this Babylonian belief system nullifies all the commandments of Yahuwah by their tradition, teaching doctrines and commandments of men, according to Mark 7, 13 and Matthew 15, verses 6 to 9. The Talmudic literature is one long song of praise for the very name Babylon. And all that it means to the Babylonian Talmudism today, whereas it is a term of reproach in the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashahs, other Hebrews also acquired from the Chaldeans their doctrine of Eastern mysticism. These were later developed into a written uh, compendium of esoteric uh, literature known as the Jewish Kabbalah or Kabbalah, and in the Middle Ages as the Latin Kabbalah. Kabbalah in Hebrew is the hidden wisdom of the Hebrew rabbis of the Middle Ages derived from the older secret doctrines uh, concerning divine things and cosmology, which were combined into a theology after that time of the captivity of the Hebrews in Babylon. All the works that fall under the uh, esoteric category are termed Kabbalah. So Kabbalah is an unwritten or oral tradition. The Kabbalist is a student of secret science, one who interprets the hidden meanings of the scriptures with the help of the symbolic Kabbalah. The Tanaman were the first Kabbalists among the Hebrews. They appeared at Jerusalem about the beginning of the third century, and this secret doctrine is identical to the Persian wisdom or magic. So Kabbalah comprised originally the entire Tra uh, traditional lore in contradiction to the Torah or the written law, and therefore included the prophetic books in the Bible. Because of its heretic nature, the Kabbalah was not generally widely known among the Hebrews, but remained the secret doctrine of elect Hebrews. So when Yahuwah is calling, calling us out of Babylon, his chosen people of Yahuwah, he's calling us. He's calling us out of something. He's telling us to come out of her. So in scripture, Babylon is a system for confusion because it was at the Tower of Babel that Yahuwah confounded the languages of the rebellious builders. And in ancient Akkadian, the word Babylon, Babili, uh, meant a gateway of the gods. So Babylon is much larger than a single entity. Babylon is confusion, and it is the gateway of the gods. So Babylon is a symbol of Hasatan's entire infrastructure of delusion and deceit. It encompasses all error 
and all religious bodies that are, are intertwined with any degree of error. So Hasatan's delusion is so successful because it rests on spiritual pride. All who reject the call insist that it cannot apply to them because they are not in Babylon. Each one possesses some truth, which he thinks sets him apart as different from everyone else. The truth he believes makes him feel spiritually superior. Therefore, the message does not apply to him. This is a deep spiritual blindness and is one of Hasatan's most successful end-time delusions. The final generation has been Baruch, with a wealth of spiritual truth and understanding, far exceeding that given any preceding generations. In desperation, Hasatan has twisted this tremendous baraka by leading minds to assume that with all the truth they already have, there is no further truth necessary for salvation. Thus, by default, any advanced knowledge or understanding is automatically rejected as wrong. Yahuwah's great heart of love foresaw this danger, awaiting the final generation. Scripture warns that spiritual pride and its resultant blindness is the greatest danger facing the last generation. And the Moloch of the Ecclesias, of the Lacedians, write, I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3, verses 14, 17. This is referred to as the Lacedian message. The greater the truth one believes, the greater exists the danger of spiritual pride and its accompanying blindness. People will even openly acknowledge that they are Laodicean. But because they have said the words, because they have verbally admitted they believe the message no longer applies to them, they take pride in the fact that they are humble enough to admit their Laodicean condition and use it as proof that the warning no longer applies to them. Thus, they continue on their spiritual blindness, in need of everything, but claiming they need nothing. And we all know these kind of people. We've all come across them in our journeys, in this walk. See, Babylon, as the gateway of the gods, involves counterfeit worship, worship of Hasatan, Beelzebub, Baal, a.k.a. the Lord, or even Jay-Z. See, Yahuwah's arch enemy is called Baal in scripture. Thus, the call to come out of Babylon involves the restoration of true worship. Remember, the call to flee Babylon goes to Yahuwah's chosen people. As such, they are not willfully in error, but ignorantly in error. Nevertheless, the error intertwined in their belief system reveals that they are in Babylon. If they are not walking in the ancient ways of the Tanakh, and they are following other directives of man, traditions, whatever that might be, and they are in error, then I believe that they are in a spiritual Babylon because they are in confusion. See, what agreement has the temple of Yahuwah with idols? For you are the temple of the living Elohim. And as Yahuwah has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahuwah, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty Yahuwah. The Corinthians 6, verse 16 and 18. Come out, my people, flee from Babylon, save yourselves, run from Yahuwah's fierce anger. Jeremiah 51, verse 45. See, Babylon the Great, described in the book of Revelation, is the world's collective body of false religions, which Yahuwah rejects. Revelation 14, 8, 17, 5, 18, verse 21. Although those religions differ in many respects, in one way or another, they all lead people away from the worship of the true Alhim Yahuwah. Deuteronomy 4. Verse 35, 
So there is some keys to identifying Babylon the Great. So let's take a look and see what they might be. Babylon the Great is a symbol. Scripture describes her as a woman and a great prostitute, having a name that is a mystery, Babylon the Great, according to Revelation 17, 1, verses 3 and 5. The book of Revelation is presented in signs, so it is reasonable to conclude that Babylon the Great is a symbol, not a, literary, a literal woman. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. In addition, she sits on many waters, which represents peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 15. A literal woman could not do that. Babylon the Great represents an internal entity. She is called the great city that has a kingdom over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 18. Thus, she has international scope and influence. Number three, Babylon the Great is a religious entity, not a political or a, com a commercial one. Ancient Babylon was so profoundly religious city known for its use of uh, uh, spirit uh, spells and sorceries, according to Isaiah 47, verses 1, 12, and 13, and Jeremiah 50, verses 1, 2, and 38. In fact, false religion in opposition to the true Alhim, Yahuwah, was practiced there. Genesis 10, verses 8 and 9, 11, verses 2, 4, as well as 8. See, the rulers of Babylon arrogantly exalted themselves above Yahuwah and his worship, which we see in Isaiah 14, 4, 13 and 14. Daniel 5, verses 2 through 4, as well as 23. And likewise, Babylon... The great is known for her spiritual practices. That shows her to be a religious organization. Revelation 18, 23. Babylon the great cannot be a political entity because the kings of the earth mourn her destruction. According to Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2, and 18, verse 9. Neither is she a commercial power because scripture distinguishes her from the merchants of the earth. Revelation 18, verse 11 and 15. Revelation 17, 9. So this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, I, I looked into two different things as I'm looking into this parallel of this. We know that Rome was established on seven hills to mark the ancient boundaries of the city. But we also see that there's seven hills of Jerusalem, which are the mounts that are surrounding the city. So this, this clue that we've been given can still refer to the Roman Catholic Church, can also uh, equate to Jerusalem or that religious system that comes from Jerusalem. False religion of Babylon the Great. So let's take a look at this. Rather than teaching people how to draw closer to the true Alhim, Yahuwah, false religion actually leads them to worship other Alhim. Scripture calls this spiritual prostitution in Leviticus 20, verse 6, Exodus 34, verses 15 and 16. Beliefs such as the Trinity and immoral, immortal uh, immorality of the soul and practices such as the use of images and worship date back to ancient Babylon and continue to permeate false religion. These religions also blend their worship with love for the world. Scripture refers to this form of unfaithfulness as spiritual adultery in James 4.4. False religion's wealth and showy display of its uh, match the picture that scripture paints of Babylon the Great who is clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, according to Revelation 17, 4. So Babylon the Great is the source of the disgusting things of the earth or the teachings and actions that actually dishonor Yahuwah, Revelation 17, 5. The members of false religion are the peoples and crowds and nations and tongues who support Babylon the Great, 
according to Revelation 17, 15. Purple represents royalty, majesty, and high officials, which we see in Judges 8, verse 26, and Esther 8, 15, as well as conveying the meaning of wealth, prosperity, and luxury, which we see in Exodus 28, 5, Ezekiel 27, 7, Proverbs 31, 22, Song of Solomon 3, verse 10, as well as 7, verse 5, Luke 16, 19, Acts 16, 14, Revelation 17, 4, 18, 12, and 16. Purple was an integral part of the temple and its services, which we see in Exodus 25, 4, 26, 1, 36, as well as 27, verse 16. And we also see it in Numbers 4, verse 13, and many other places. It was used in curtains or veils, if you will, carpets found in the tabernacle, along with blue, scarlet, and white as well as the garments worn by the high priest. Working with it was such an important skill that King Solomon requested from Tyre's king, Hiram, a man specializing in dyeing with it, which we see in 2 Chronicles 2, 7, to supervise the building of the temple. Scarlet was mentioned in Genesis 38, verse 28. It was one of the colors of the ephod in Exodus 28, verse 6. The girdle in verse 8 and the breastplate 15 of the high priest. It's also mentioned in various other connections in Joshua 2, verse 18, 2 Samuel 1, 24, Lamentations 4, verse 5, and Nahum 2, verse 3. Our scarlet robe was placed in mockery on our Adon Yahusha in Matthew 27, 28, and Luke 23, 11. We also see skins, uh, sins as scarlet. In Isaiah 1, verse 18. In the Roman Catholic Church, scarlet is the color worn by the cardinals and is associated with the blood of Christ and the Christian martyrs and with sacrifice. Scarlet is often associated with immorality and sin, particularly prostitution and or adultery, and largely because of a passage referring to the great harlot dressed in purple and scarlet and the scriptures we find in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. The one color we see missing in the description of Babylon the Great is the word blue, which occurs 50 times, all of which are in the Tanakh. The Hebrew word translated as this color is Tekula, the Strong's H8504. Its meaning is that of representing Yahuwah, which we see in Exodus 24.10. 25, 3, 38, 18, as well as Numbers 4, 6, as well as 12, Second Chronicles 2, verse 7, Ezekiel 1, verse 26, and there's other places as well. Royalty, we see in Esther 1, 6, Ezekiel 23, verse 6, Jeremiah 10, verse 9, or service to Yahuwah and righteous living, which we see in Exodus 28, verse 6 and 8, 13 and 31, Numbers 15, verse 38 through 40, and Esther 8, verse 15. So Moshe, Aaron, two of Aaron's sons, and the 70 elders of Yahshua went up Mount Sinai to worship Yahuwah, where he gave the Yahshualites the Ten Commandments in stone, which we see in Exodus 24. And scripture states that they noticed that under his feet was some sort of pavement made of sapphire, blue. And they saw the Elohim of Yasserel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stones, and as it were, the heavens in clearness. Exodus 24, verse 10. Sapphires, one of the many gemstones mentioned in Scripture, is referred, uh, referenced nine times in Yahuwah's word. The gem reflects a beautiful sky blue color. Sapphires are also found in the breastplate of judgment, sometimes worn by the high priest, which we see in Exodus 28, verse 18. Now I'm going to read you these verses in Exodus. There's, there's a few of them, but as we see, they all have the same order, and they all have blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, and goat hair, which we see in Exodus 25, 4. 
Exodus 26, 1, moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. You shall make them with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Exodus 26, 31, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Exodus 26, 36, you shall make a screen for the doorway of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of a weaver. Exodus 27, 16, for the gate of the court, there shall be a screen of 20 cubics of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of a weaver with their four pillars and their four sockets. Exodus 28, 5, they shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen. Exodus 28, 6, they shall also make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of a skillful workman. Exodus 28, 8, the skillfully woven band, which is on it, shall be like its workmanship of the same material of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Exodus 28, 15, you shall make a breast piece of judgment, the work of a skillful workman. Like the work of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen. You shall make it. Exodus 28, 33. You shall make on its hem pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material all around on its hem and bells of gold between them all round. Exodus 35, 6, and blue and purple and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair. Exodus 35, 23, every man who had in his possession blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and uh, for, uh, proposed skin brought them. Exodus 35, 25, all the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material and in fine linen. Exodus 35, 35, he had filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and in fine linen of a weaver as performers of every work and maker of designs. Exodus 36, verse 8. All the skillful men among those who were performing the work made the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Bazaal made them. Exodus 36, 35. Moreover, he made the veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. He made it with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Exodus 36, 37. He made a screen for the doorway of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of a weaver. Exodus 38, 18. The screen of the gate of the court was the work of the weaver, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. And the length was 20 cubics, and the height was five cubics, corresponding to the hangings of the court. Exodus 38, 23, with him was Obaliah, the son of Ashima, of the tribe of Dan an engraver and a skillful workman and a weaver in blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen. Exodus 39, 1. Moreover, from the blue and the purple and the scarlet material, they made finely woven garments for ministering in the Kadosh place as well as the Kadosh garments, which were for Aaron, just as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. Exodus 39, 2. And he made the ephod of gold and of blue, and of purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen. 
Exodus 39.3. Then they hammered out gold sheets and cut them into threads to be woven in with the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen and the work of the skillful workmen. Exodus 39.5. The skillfully woven band which was on it was like its workmanship of the same material of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted lemon, just as Yahuwah commanded Moshe. Exodus 39, 8, he made the breastpiece the work of a skillful workman, like the workmanship of the ephod of gold and of, pur of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Exodus 39, 24, they made pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet material and twisted linen on the hem of the robe. Exodus 39, 29, and the sash of the fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material, the work of the weaver, just as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. See, as we see these same colors spoken of for Babylon the Great, we see them within the priests, the temple, the tabernacle. It's interesting, but it's missing the one color, blue. See, Babylon the Great is responsible for the deaths of the prophets and of the set-apart believers and of all those having been slain on the earth. Revelation 18.24. Throughout history, false religion has not only fermented wars and fueled acts of terrorism, but has also failed to teach people the truth about Yahuwah, the Elohim of love. 1 John 4.8. This failure has contributed to much bloodshed. For good reason, those who want to please Yahuwah must get out of her, separating themselves from false religion. Revelation 18, verses 4, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 and 17. History tells us that the Babylonian Empire fell very suddenly and very unpleasantly to the Persians under Cyrus the Great in 539 B.C., Later, when Darius, the king of the Babylonians, revolted unsuccessfully and as a conqueror, they experienced many of the same brutalities they had previously inflicted upon the Hebrews. The Babylonians themselves strangled many of their wives and children to keep them from starving to death during the brutal siege of their capital city. And when the city, uh, the city fell, Herodus says the great city were pulled down and 3,000 of the leading citizens were impaled upon the walls. The once great city, the queen of the world, was defeated, devastated, and despoiled, just like Yahuwah said. So Babylon next appears in scriptural narrative about 630 years later. The former seat of empire is now a village surrounded and nearly swallowed by a sea of sand. And yet her name begins to reappear in the Brit Hadashah canon as a symbol of the world at war with the people of Yahuwah. See, Kepha uses it as a sort of code. He ends his epistle to the assemblies of Pontius and Berthia by saying, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Shalom to all of you who are in Mashiach. 1 Peter 5, verses 13 and 14. She who was at Babylon. Kepha was, never, was, was nowhere near Babylon when he wrote that letter. Kepha was in Rome. But he uses the word Babylon as a symbolic way of, of referring to the new world culture at war with the covenant community. Kepha is saying Rome is the new Babylon and is the new... Uh, mistress who would seduce and subvert the people of Yahuwah. Thus, Yahuwah says, come out of her, my people, return to me in my ways. And as we see, there's that call. Is it out of one specific place? As we see referenced here, there's a, there's an intermingling of these world religions. They adopt a lot of the same belief systems that lead people away from Yahuwah. Therefore, of course, Rome matches Babylon the Great, but I also see through the descriptions that we read that there's also a 
a possibility that we could be coming out of Jerusalem, that city, but the Judaism that comes from there that was confronted by Yahusha in his day. So as we have this discussion, let's keep our minds open to what we've read and what we've learned here. And let's see if we can really see and narrow down who we really believe it is. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth that comes forth. And we ask you to give us that truth. Give us the answers to these, these questions that we are seeking answers to. So, Father, we just thank you once again for this opportunity to study your word and to and allow you to bring us more clarification and more answers. So we give you praise and honor this day. Give us the ears to hear you. Give us the eyes to see you clearly and let your Ruach stir your people today. Through Yahushua we pray, hallelujah, hallelujah. All righty. Well, I know that was uh, very interesting for me. A lot of the study that I did here really brought clarification, but it also brought me more questions, as it usually does. So as we're discussing this this morning, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Yahuwah reveals to us. Hallelujah. I know, Brother Jadiel, I think I've seen you come in. Are you here with us? Shalom, brother. Shalom. Shalom, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, a lot of this is uh, definitely things to, to keep in mind. Um, just wanted to point out the the fact that there's two women in, in Revelation. You know, there's, there's a woman in, in Revelation 12. Uh, I think you mentioned it uh, in the in the study. I think in part one of the study also. And um. And then you have this woman that's contrary to to that woman, you know. Um, and the woman that bore Yahushua, it says. It says that Yahushua came out, and when the dragon tried to devour him, the man child was caught up, you know. And then the woman was, we talked about that a little bit more as to what does the woman represent. And um, there's, there's, there's something that, that I wanted to point out with pertaining to the woman, uh, something that um, Brother Will brought out yesterday. And uh, he was asking a question about the woman and we saw in Revelation 12 that it the woman was a sim symbolism of the covenant that Yah has made. Uh, Galatians chapter four talks about two women being two covenants <clears throat> and that the, the woman's the woman has children and that we were the actual children of the woman. So if you look at the, the meaning of that uh, Galatians chapter four, it says that we are the children of the covenant. We are the children of the covenant, the ones that are from the covenant. But then there's also another woman in which uh, perpetuates bondage, a broken covenant. So when you break the covenant, yeah, you become ca captive to sin. Uh, captive to, to Hasatan's thing. So when you're looking in Revelation, you have these two women again. Uh, and in Revelation 12, verse 17, it says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her children, which keep the commandments of Elohim and has a testimony of Yahushua Messiah. So he is wroth with the woman, but he's making war with her children. He's making war with her children. This is this is how this is what the symbolism is is representing. So likewise, you have a woman that's a harlot. So you have a, a broken covenant, an unfaithful covenant, and um, just just uh just to keep in mind the historical reference. You know, so that way we can kind of get a clarity when we're looking at at, at the kingdoms of this earth now and and all of these things now that uh you know it's is we have to see who was faithful to yah that they would be unfaithful to him who was in a covenant that they would break a covenant with them and uh you know just an, again to reiterate i know we talked about this last week yeah. like islam can't be 
they were never in a covenant to break the covenant. Um, the Zionists, they were never in a covenant. The Ashkenazis, they were never in a covenant to break a covenant, you know, to become a harlot to Yah, you know. So there's there has to be something in which which deems something polluted that was once not polluted. Uh, I think we talked about this yesterday also in the Q and A. That even in Hosea, it was the it was Israel that became a harlot because they were once faithful to Yah, and then they became unfaithful, which is why they were referred to as a harlot. Uh, I think that a lot of times we hear harlot, and then we assume prostitute because they just throw themselves around. But in actuality, Scripture is talking about like a person who was once faithful and has committed harlotry or whoredom. So in Revelation, it talks about the great harlot or the great whore, referring to her unfaithfulness to God and polluting the nations. That's why it says that they are they are drunk with the wine of her fornication. The wine of her fornication of her, it, it uses another unlawful sexual term, fornication, you know. But if this was a disconnect like every other king and every other wicked nation, they wouldn't be considered a harlot. They're just considered wicked, you know. So I just just think that that's something important to keep in mind when analyzing, you know, Revelation and Daniel and different things like that. Um, because when we understand what to come out of, uh, it's not necessarily come out of Zionism. You know, Zionism is not mingling with the world, but there is a false, <laughs> uh, what they call Christianity that is mingling with the world mingling with the whole world like every aspect of the world has this essence of of catholicism in it you know um you don't see the prime minister of, of israel which is you know not even a, he's not even a, a torah follower going to all over the world to influence all the kings of the world but you do see one power one religious power going to not only every king of the world but he's also going to every religion of the world and be and leading leading every religion into this this uh collaborative effort to help the world in some type of way you know so i think um it's kind of yeah puts things in prophecy in order for us to look and see not for us to assume and speculate something that's hidden but for us to clearly see what the enemy is doing you know the enemy doesn't know um, not not the enemy like in Hasatan, but the enemy, those who are walking in wickedness don't understand prophecy. So when they do their things, they don't know that we can clearly see what Yah shows us in scripture when they perform it in public. You know, so I think that it's good to, for us to look at the things in scripture and com connect it to those uh, in the public. Um, the Zionists are not the same as the Israelites that connected themselves to Rome in the, in the, 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 the Gospels. When they said we have no king but Caesar, they were they were actual Israelites. And Rome destroyed them in 70 AD when he burned down Jerusalem. He didn't commit fornication with them. He destroyed them. You know, so um, the ones that are now Zionists are not original Israelites. So I just wanted to point that out as well, just to just to add a little bit more information to our, our search. That's good information. My, my thought, though, is we're looking at this because it caught my attention. I never noticed this before. And I see the parallels where there could be two two options. And what you're just pointing out kind of leads the, 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 the uh, scale towards the Roman Catholic Church because of what they have done in their representation, how they uh, do embrace these colors uh, that are spoke of about Babylon, uh, Babylon the Great. But we also see, as I was pointing out here, these same colors were worn in the tabernacle, throughout the tabernacle, and by the priest, the high priest. And uh, so, but the but the one thing I noticed there was that the color blue was missing, you know, from the description of Babylon versus what we see within all of Exodus is talking about the color scheme. And there was a, about 20-some verses there that had the same order of everything 
and we don't see that in the other parts. So it leads me to believe that because of the blue, the royalty and, and the meaning of what that represents, that um, it's something that's like of servitude to Yahuwah is what it's referencing, you know, something that's connected to him because there's a references that, that connect him to this blue. We know that it has to do with the covenant, you know, that it's in the, 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 uh, the fringes, you know, the colors, the, the blue and that it, that's called there. And that's missing. So to me, that is a sign uh, that, that will lead us closer to what this Babylonian uh, religion is, because I truly believe it's a religion that encompasses the whole world's uh, economics and all of that type of stuff. And looking back at, like, how does Yisrael or Israel, if you will, how do they fit into this mold of being able to, you know, make the, 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 the mariners rich and those type of things? We don't see that as an example throughout history that, that, that they were the place for that. But we do see that, again, the Rome, if you will, which was, and I only say Rome because they're the ones that created and established they killed or they were used to kill the Messiah and they, they replaced the, 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 the belief system, if you will, with their own doctrine, their own beliefs. And therefore, I believe that it is showing us as revealing something there. But I wanted to get your take on that uh, with, the, with the color blue missing in the description and what your thoughts are on that. Because to me, that's saying something like what I, what I believe, you know, that they're, they're, they're lacking the covenant part which is what really lines them up with the people or the, uh, the high priest, if you will, versus this apostasy religion that we see. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I, I, that's, that's interesting also, because um, when you look at the priesthood, you'll see that Rome is, is, uh, has replicated the priesthood. In, in their own lawless way. It's not like Talmud where they're instringent on doing works to the T. This is a pollution of lawlessness. There's a man of lawlessness, not a law, you know, not trying to keep the law with works, it's lawless, you know? So you have Israel, they close everything down on Shabbat. They, they try to do things based off of their works that is that is similar to what's located in the scripture. But then you have the lawless one calling himself a priest, calling himself father, forgiving your sin. Even in their services, they take a golden censer and they spin it around. They have a table called the Eucharist that's formulated like the Ark of the Covenant. You know, they've taken the priesthood and, and replicated it in their own in their own services in a lawless way you know with Id with idols circling them you know it's different than trying to perform these these things traditionally like when they had hanukkah and they tried to offer uh, a, a sacrifice and they couldn't so they offered a leg of lamb over there in israel but now you have this replicate of 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 a priest being known as a priest throughout the world you know, I do think that all these wicked religions, not necessarily as mentioned in scripture, but are a part of the big grand picture. Because remember, it's it's the whole earth. According to Revelation 13, the whole earth is involved in creating this image of the beast. You see what I'm saying? So it's not like uh, that certain things are not involved. All these wicked nations are involved in the creating this image. Well, that leads me to another thought then because you're, you're talking about all of these images and idols that are created and represented in this Babylonian uh, representative Babylonian the Great. Well, we know that Catholicism is big into that. But if we look at the other possibility being with, you know, Jerusalem or, or, or uh, Judaism, if you will, I think that uh, what you're just saying there is because they don't, they're against that. So that almost is another sign that it's probably not speaking about them. And the only reason I bring up this is because, well, we have Brother Nathaniel that has this, uh, that talked to me about this, which I, I could see how a lot of that lined up, which made me look a lot at this. But 
as we're looking at breaking down Babylon and what it's describing there, and like you said, lawless, there's a lot of things that are involved in this, this system, this religion um, that is identifying factors that we are trying to diagnose and see, do they exist here or are they only here? And so far, everything seems to be shifting all over to, you know, the Roman Catholic side, if you will, that church, that belief system, which I believe is also responsible for creating this image of the beast. Like you said, it's a worldwide thing. Um, the one thing that is accepted worldwide is Christianity, is Catholicism, you know, like you said, how he is basically, he meets with all the kings of the earth, all the rulers of the earth. It doesn't matter if they're religious or not, you know. So there's another descriptive factor there. Good points, brother. Good points. Right. I, I wanted to also mention how if you look at the history of, of the Roman Roman uh, um, organization, the Roman religious organization, they're extremely political. Their, their influence is to get the world to join in, not only those from other faiths, but even atheists, they're, they're including in their religious movement, you know, um, Islamic and, 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 uh, and Judaism is very stringent on their traditions and their, their assumptions. And even though they're behind the scenes, politically, they're, they're in a they act a certain way. We have this, um, compromise that they make towards the Catholicism, towards um, this false Christianity, um, because they, uh, uh, they were, there was a, a news report and how the prime minister over in Israel was, they were talking about uh, having like a day of rest and they said it could be Sunday. These are, this was a Jewish lady writing a book saying it could be Sunday. You know, so there's this compromise of them shifting, not holding up your standard. Of course not. Then, of course, if you're not with Yah, it doesn't matter what you do. You're not going to hold up his standard. So it was easy for them to easily compromise and say that they could have a day, a universal day of rest on Sunday. Also, you know, who who would who would admit to that? Like, you can't go to a Catholic church and try to change them up. That's that's not going to happen. You can't go to the Vatican and say something and they say yeah we're gonna do it your way like no what they do is they take your stuff and still do it their own way they took babylon that's why babylon is such an appropriate term because it's confusion it's the combination of everything it's amalgamation of everything it's not just a in a, a a strict view of false tradition it's an amalgamation of everything put together in order for them to control everything you know so you have all these different mental perceptions and they're going in different directions and what did the catholic do which the word catholic means universal what do they do they take everything in order to direct everyone's mind to the same place which is honor me and my ideals you know and um no 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 israeli uh, no, is this is <laughs> listen to this. I think it's, I think you mentioned this also on um, in the last video as well about how um, something happened in September, right? Well, something also happened when the Pope came to Congress in the United States to address Congress in how they legislate laws in, in this country. And the way that, and I'm pretty sure you could look it up, the way that they address the Pope is like you, your eminence, holy father. Like this is how they address him. Like nobody's calling no prime minister of Israel, your eminence, holy father, none of that stuff. You know, but when he comes around, they're like bowing down to him. You know, before Biden went into office, he had to kind of get first inaugurated by the Pope. <laughs> and then he went over, you know, which is, which is a normal thing. Um, but it, it, it hasn't been where one person who follows after the Pope, because this, this is what Biden professes to be Catholic. He professes to be a Catholic, you know, Catholic. So the only thing is John F. Kennedy, they, they keep comparing him to John F. Kennedy, which is ridiculous. John F. Kennedy said um, that 
he doesn't speak for the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church don't speak for him. And when he was about to expose things, I can I, I think everybody, else, if you do your research, you'll know that Rome was one of the things he was exposing before he got shot. You know, so it's it's very it's it's very detailed. Revelation is very detailed. Like there's no symbol that's there for no reason. You know, every symbol is there for a reason, and we have a backup because remember, the Book of Revelation is a letter. It's a prophetic letter to the assemblies, but every letter in the New Testament is directly connected to the Torah and to the prophets. So it has to be connected to the prophetic symbolisms in the Torah and the prophets, you know? And you know what's funny? You know what it says in the Torah? It says, if a woman lies down with a beast, it's confusion. And that word confusion is tabel, which is another root, as another offshoot of babel. So it's interesting how Torah teaches that if a woman lies down with the beast, it's confusion. And we have this woman mixing herself with kings, which are referred to as beasts. It's like an amalgamation. It's confusion. And he refers to it as Babylon. You know, and then you go to the book of Daniel and you can get more clarity on the symbolisms of the animals. And it tells you detail. It's go the same son of perdition that's going to come go into destruction and sit in the temple as like he's Elohim is the same one that's going to be there when the Messiah comes back and he's going to destroy him with the, with his, with the, um, with the brightness of his coming in second Thessalonians chapter two, you know, so if we look at it, there's one kingdom that starts long time ago and it ends all the way at the time that Messiah comes back. And that is the iron, the iron, according to Daniel two, you know, and we can't take the elements and like put it on something else you know, and then, um, you know, you can't switch it around. We don't have that wiggle room. Prophecy is not of any private interpretation. We have to allow the prophets to tell us what the prophets are saying, you know, so praise God for, for this, praise God for this to, to intrigue and to stir up our minds to kind of get involved a little bit deeper into what these things mean. So that way we can open our eyes and look around and actually see what's going on and be able to warn others what's happening. Hallelujah. Well, this, this study really has opened my eyes. I didn't know that there was seven hills in Jerusalem, too, that surround it and is built on that. So it's, there's also another one that's called uh, the city built on the, the seven hills. So I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. So that took me to those two parallels, you know. But the things that you're, you're pointing out are, are so important for us to, to really see from what is the description is it's telling us. And a lot of people say, well, it can't be Rome, 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 you know. Uh, is, isn't uh, isn't religion, but the Roman Empire and uh, Constantine actually made them, gave them that position where the the funds would actually go to the the Catholics uh, to be able to control that and to monitor that. And we see that still today. All of that is still, in, especially here in the United States, and we know that we are connected to that uh, that entity as well through the church and all of the relationships that they have there in Washington, you know, how it's district of Columbia, which is basically that connection right back to there again, you know, so they, they definitely have control of the financial aspect and they're trying to even gain more control as far as the religious stuff, like you said, trying to create a, a day of worship worldwide, uh, which is on Sunday, like you said, in Jerusalem, you know, I don't know that they're going to go for that. There may, there's definitely going to be people there that are, but I don't know. All of those things just made me very interested and really had me captivated because there was stuff I didn't know going through this that really stood out to me. And uh, I think it's really clarifying who I, who I see it speaking about, you know, you hear both arguments who it could be, but this, some things really narrow things down a little bit more, you know what I mean? Right. Right. And, you know, because I think that's, that what you're saying narrow down the weight, the weight of evidence. You know, there's a you, if you if we take a few few instances of scripture and we could kind of go different directions, you know, but when you narrow down everything together, you know, you, we can't deny the book of Daniel in regards to looking at Revelation. You have a beast with a leopard body, a lion mouth, bare feet. And then you look in Daniel chapter seven, you have a lion, a bear, and a leopard. It's like you have the same elements, but in Revelation, it seems to be amalgamated into one 
actual beasts. And the time and of it the, seems like the everything is revo- too, is it? the time of its uh, like 40 huh? month, the 42 months is the same too. 120 uh, right yeah the 40 60 the 42 months the 100 the 1260 uh, days the three and a half two. years it's the same yep. it's the same number just said in different ways you know so we have this beast amalgamated and then you have in revelation 13 when the mark of the beast comes out mark of the beast it's actually causing the world to honor the first beast that's amalgamated so once you find out what the first beast is, then you'll know what the world is going to go marvel after, because after that, the mark of the beast comes out. So it's not a matter of all these other people that's involved in it. It's a matter of who's the who's the, the religious power sitting on top of the beast directing the kingdoms. The kings of the earth are giving their power over to this thing, you know. That's that's another element. When you look in Revelation, they give their power to this. Nobody's giving their power. Trump went over there and had to tell them that Jerusalem is the capital. Like nobody's giving their power. Matter of fact, it seems like they're sharing it, you know, or they're just going over there and, and helping them out. You know, but as far as giving their power, like who are giving their power? Every every kingdom gives their power over to this one entity and you can see how he just flaunts and the united nation is a is a is a collaboration of all the nations of all the powerful nations of the world and they're the ones that called pope francis to come uh about four years ago when he first started to handle foreign affairs with all the other nations yeah i remember including israel including israel and dealing with israel and palestine calling the pope to go to the leader of islam and the leader of israel to try to help them get peace the zionists are not the ones controlling rome rome is the one controlling the zionists why because rome has the money rome is controlling the money one time too so yeah, control it. Yes, definitely. Matter of fact, the money still traffics to the Vatican. There's a bank in the Vatican that the the Bank of Britain, the Zionists, and the United States transfers money to the Vatican. You know, so and this is not like private information. This is like just financial information that everybody knows. Like you could look it up and see where the money is going. That's why people are like, "What's going on?" You so know, those but clues then are you, know, you ask closer. <laughs> right you you ask too much questions and you see like here's the thing like politically and i'm sorry for talking too much this is real you know, this is so real it's so real you know politically if you try to control people politically and financially people who even people who don't believe in yah they will rise up and they will fight you back this is the the nature of history. Every time there's always a revolt when when you when you try to press somebody too much politically, they're going to come at you. If you control the mind, <laughs> if you make people think it's okay, they are not going to fight you. So what do you do? You have to add a religious aspect to control the beliefs of the people. If you control the beliefs of the people, you can oppress the people and they don't even know they're being oppressed. This is this is the way that empires have ruled throughout history. Look at what happened with the Maccabees. They forced them to learn Greek religion. The, 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 the military forced them to sacrifice on their altars whatever they wanted. You know, Babylon, when the music plays, you bow down to the image, the image of the beast. <laughs> you know, what does that mean? You know, when 30 days, you make sure you pray to Darius. Why do you, all these religious laws that is the main thing that's causing these deaths of Yah's people? It's always the death of Yah's people. Look at look at Jezebel. What happened to Jezebel? Jezebel marries Ahab. That's an unlawful marriage. What does Jezebel do after he marries Ahab? Kills the prophets of Yah. Why is he killing the prophets of Yah? Because the prophets of Yah are trying to uphold Yah's law. John the Baptist, Herodias marries Herod. That's an unlawful marriage, right? Unlawful marriage. So what happens? Guess what that woman wants to do? Kill John the Baptist. Why? Because he's telling them that it's unlawful to be married. So if you notice, 
that when you look at Revelation 12, he's wroth with the dragon and he's making war with the seed. Why? Because they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yahushua Messiah. It's the same pattern all the way through the scriptures, bringing us all the way to the same thing. You have the book of Romans written to the people in Rome. What do they do? They join themselves with the government of Rome. They get a hold of the military. What do they do after that? They start killing Yah's people. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. And guess what? They never disappeared since then. What's happening now? You have all the nations of the world. Now, it's not just one nation. You have all the nations of the world calling this religious group. And they're connecting themselves. Guess what that is? That's an unlawful connection. What are they going to do? Because remember, church and state is, is against the law, by the way. You remember? So what are they going to do? They're going to start becoming lawless, like they said. And what are Yah's people going to do? We're going to promote Yah's law. And what are they going to do? Be behead Yah's people. We have Revelation 12. All the martyrs that were beheaded because they did not want to take the mark of the beast. What happened to John the Baptist? He was beheaded because he did not com compromise with telling them about the law. We don't have to even try to figure anything out. All we have to do is put all the pieces together and see one big picture. It's the same spirit. Hasatan is the same Hasatan before, and he's going to do the same thing again. Uh, Ecclesiastes, it says, what has happened? There's nothing new under the sun. So we don't have to try to create something new in Revelation. Nothing is new under the sun. What has happened will happen again. And what will be has already happened. So all we have to do is co collab, uh, uh, put together everything that has happened, see the similarities, and then we can clearly see Revelation the same way that we see every every historical event. You know, it's just going to be ten. It's just going to be a higher magnitude. That's what Messiah says. It's going to be worse than he's ever seen in in the history of the world. So even though there's similarities, he says in Matthew Matthew chapter twenty four it's going to be worse than it's ever been. You know, you have one king mixing itself with religious organizations. Now you have all the kings fornicating with this religious organization. That's totally different. But yeah, I'm a, sorry. Interesting. It really opens your mind to really thinking and really pondering because we know these days are limited and we're coming to this place quickly. And like you said, they're already talking about this Sunday situation which is going to come against Yah's people and so that's going to put us right in the spotlight so you know I think these these studies are to prepare us and to ready us for the days that are ahead of us because there's some days that are coming that aren't going to be too pleasant for the believers of Yahuwah you know so we have to be strong in our moon we have to understand what we're coming up against and what's coming after us um, because the the dragon is coming after the people of Yahuwah, the children. He's waging war, and it's coming. So I believe that these lessons that we're going through are to pre prepare us and ready us so we're not taken by surprise. Hallelujah. Brother JP, where are you at, brother? Let me see you. <laughs> there he is. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Good morning, Shabbat Mr. shalom, Ms. Praga. My family. Um, I don't know, you know, those <laughs> Chadi, I just gave him, he just came and put some more on it. Like, just, I like the visuals, though, in the, in the study, though. And, um, and then I like that you brought out talking about, uh, um Tammuz and the whole because it kind of brings clarity to the Trinitarian mindset um something that I know it is dealt with a lot because you know emotionally we, I feel like people are caught up in the Trinitarian mindset I was once caught up in that same mindset and so to bring out that that understanding of history is pretty interesting you know it's pretty interesting and to show um because again where where do we get this understanding like where do we get this information um of uh you know this the way that the trinitarian mindset is it's like well you look at like you said history and and what what you show today it just kind of shows that that 
way of how it's transferred over and over throughout the centuries and to where we get to today. And so many times, we, you know, there's a there's a sister who talks about like certain words, right? And she said a word like mes like the word mesmerize, like it comes from a name a man. I think his name was Mesmer. And so he made up this word. So, and I bring it up as an example of, we don't even know, and we don't think about him no more. And we just can, now we just do this. And we say, oh, you, you were, this person was mesmerized by whatever. And so when you think about the, uh, when you think about that kind of understanding and you go into the religious system, they've done this over and over and over and over and over. So that people today are just doing something that they don't have no question about because it's been embedded in them. And so I just thought that was interesting. And, and that's what I think about the Trinitarian mindset when it comes down to it. Um, and much more, of course, like Brother Jody Allen, you brought out. Um, so, um, but praise Yahuwah. I uh, still, got, still got to go over a lot of it in my mind to understand more about um what it is today and how it is today for us and things like that. But praise your Lord. Shabbat Shalom, brother. Shabbat Shalom to all y'all. Hallelujah, brother. Well, if you, if you know the beginning of religion, this Babylonian system, then you can follow it through history. You can really see where it's rested. You know, you can see how it, how it's come into today's society, how it's there. It's dominant. You know, you can see it if you're paying attention and, I, that's why I think this study is is enlightening because it, it makes you to have to look and to see, you know, what is it speaking of? Who is it trying to who's it trying to warn us about, you know, so that we can be prepared. And so those people that are within that system, within that, 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 that uh, Babylonian system and don't even know because they don't know the history of their religion. They don't understand where it began. They, that's, that's so far out there behind that they have no clue, you know, where this all began and what, what makes the religion that they're in today, what it is, you know, where did it come from? How did it begin? And now we know we can go back and trace it and we can see the symbolisms today with that cross that, that everybody holds so dear that they think is, it has to do with their savior, JC. It really began with another savior, God named Tammuz. And, you know, so when you start thinking about those things and all of the other things that follow along with this Babylonian belief system that we see in the Christian church today, Easter, you know, we see that that is part of, of the Babylonian system. We see that that's still here today. You know, so the more that I try to, to try to clarify, the more clarification I'm getting about this situation and, uh, and it makes me sad quite honestly because there, there's so much you know uh confusion which is really what <laughs> it's all about when you look at what babylon means you know it's confusion it's a state of confusion you really don't know you just doing something because you're being led to do it by a, a group of people that say that they have the right way you know and people just aimlessly following without trying to research i was there you were there probably almost everybody on here was in that same position and that's a beautiful thing here because i believe those are the called ones sitting there waiting to be called out we're being called out of the out of the church and who is it that comes out as the chosen those that say i hear you and i'm gonna come back into covenant with you i'm gonna start doing things the way you said i should do them instead of the way babylon is telling me so praise you who yeah. and 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 just to kind of speak on on because we talked about the cross last night and we were talking about you know what it is it there was a question that came up that spoke about that about you know is it is it okay is it kind of like a I don't want I don't know how to restate the question but but it, it's one of those areas you know where I'm like you know I think when you you I read my scriptures I can see it says cross I'll say okay it says cross it's not a I don't, but it's the worshiping, it's the worshiping and, and where people are so, they're so caught up, they're, they're kissing their necklace. You know what I mean? You're taking it to a different level instead of just the word itself and saying, you're reading your Bible and you're saying the cross, carry your cross. 
to me, that has a lot of, like, I could feel that emotion of what Yahusha's saying. I could feel it. Even though it might have something, you know, there is, but it's like, it, it's just one of those areas that's sensitive. And it's just like, okay, can you say cross? I said, well, you know, we know that we, we went over last night. It, went, it says Storos. It says steak, and we, we can look at it that way, you know. And but it's that the idea of the worshiping of it, you know. You go into a church, they got a big old cross in the front of their church, and you're like, What? Why do you, you know? I never thought about it until I really came into more understanding of that's not appropriate. That's not appropriate. You have a wooden cross in your church, you they created something in the front of the church at that. Where everybody's facing it during the the sermon, so so I think there's that line that you got to draw between um, between whether you're just reading the word and you're worshiping it and going into that next level, and and I believe that's where I see it. It's like dangerous. It's really dangerous, you know. So uh, praise Yahuwah, brother. Shabbat shalom. Hey, brothers. Um, I wanted to mention. Um, something that that both of you actually mentioned. You mentioned the cross, Rick. JP mentioned the Trinity. And we know the root is all the way back to Babylon. You mentioned Easter. That's back to Babylon. And you see that's perpetuated throughout history. But where where does it become that mystery? Where does it where does it disappear from the origin? It it when you when it's brought to Rome, guess what happens? Then they institute Trinity. Then they institute Easter. And then there's institution of the cross. And there's an institution of all of these Babylonian doctrines. And then it's covered up in order to be instituted in society. You know, but that has never happened throughout history until we got to Rome. Because Rome was never an originator of anything. When Rome took over Greece, it was called the Greco-Roman era. Why? Because they they took everything from architecture to their gods. They took everything from the Greeks. The Greeks was took took the things from the Persians. The Persians took the things from Babylon. But when the 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 when the you know when the Catholic Church came into play, what did they do? They took all these Babylonian things and then they covered it and perpetuated it as scripture perpetuated to the point where you have Sunday you said it earlier who was the one that that instituted the first Sunday it was Constantine uh, constant because at that time the Bishop of Rome wasn't able to make no laws so it was Constantine that instituted it but he gave the army to the to the calf to the Bishop of Rome in order to enforce it so you have Sunday Trinity Easter the cross, you have all these things that are Babylonian, but now when it comes to Rome or the Roman Catholic Church, they are now forcing it upon the people. And even today, to the point where the people today don't even have a clue why they are doing Easter, Trinity, Sunday, all of these things, because they have this, this plan. And if you guys know about the Jesuit order, um, the Jesuit order are a bunch of, is a secret society amongst the Roman Catholic Church that sends out Catholic priests, which are Jesuits, to infiltrate and, and influence the people to follow after their dogmas. And if you look at Revelation, it talks about the wine that makes the, the nations drunk. Uh, Revelation 18, verse 3, where it says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath for fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So there's two things. There's people receiving this wine and becoming drunk, and then there's the kings fornicating with her. So what does it mean to get drunk? It means to intoxicate the mind, to intoxicate the mind. So you have the intoxication of the mind, and then you have the, the, the connecting with the politicians. You know, so... You know, just wanted to to bring that up. Like everything ends at Rome and is now perpetuated in a way where it can sneak into society. The Zionists are not doing that. The Zionists is one track. I mean, it's a wicked mind, but the Zionists have a one track mind. You know what I mean? But this is like uh, uh, the Jesuits are set up to go into every society 
and perpetuate what they believe into every organization, every school, every society. This is their plan. If you look it up, it's clear. Just so it's, they don't hide it. You know, so it's very interesting how they take Babylon and they put it into the society in these false beliefs that we call Christianity, you know, and when it's actually Babylonian, we don't even see how this world is becoming Babylon, you know, because it's covered up by false interpretation. So when Yah's people stand up and we start to clarify, we do the work of Elijah, right? Like John the Baptist said, every crooked way we make straight, every high place we bring low, and we prepare a people for Yah. This is what our this is what our duty is to do, is to restore everything back to the way it's supposed to be. And when we do so, we will become persecuted in that in that moment. Just like John the Baptist, just like Elijah, just like every prophet that ever exists. Well, maybe that's what this study is going to lead to. I hope not, brother. But hey. Uh, we, we definitely are exposing some stuff. I also find out that isn't the Jesuit order also like a military type of style of, uh, 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 of belief or regiment, you know, they're known as the oh, yeah. military arm or military kind of structure or something. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an infiltration structure of, of, of people who are willing to basically physically execute people if they need to in order to perpetuate when you look at the jesuit order they promise to promote every idea ideology from the roman catholic church into every port part of society to the point of even killing if they need to you know so um this is i mean this is what it's called the dark ages for a reason you don't understand the the spanish inquisition we, listen they did some crazy stuff and this is why people don't like religion because they base religion off of what they did but if you look at what they did you'll see that that's not that's some different stuff that they did and they still have that stuff today notre dame is a jesuit school you know and now people just talk about jesuit like it's nothing like it doesn't mean anything the pope there's a pope right now pope francis he's a jesuit and they had this big announcement on the news it's about oh he's the first jesuit priest he's the first jesuit pope i'm like uh yeah do you know what the jesuit order is like you think you think that he's just a priest like no there's a jesuit order that dates back to years ago when they first started this when they first started bringing babylon into every society every kingdom every king when you look at all these medieval movies if you notice, there's always like this Catholic bishop in the corner whispering some evil stuff in the king's ear. There's always uh, three musketeers, you know, it don't even matter what medieval movie, there's always some type of bishop there that the king has to make sure he lines up with. Why? Because the bishop could easily say, hey, this king is wrong, you need to follow me. Why? Because the people couldn't read the scripture. It was written in Latin. Nobody could read Latin except for them. So they had control over the people's minds and even the king had to be blessed by the bishop. And if you notice, right after Justinian, the king, emperor of Rome died, it was the Pope that had to bless each emperor of Rome. And guess what happened to Biden? He had to be blessed by the Pope as well. You know, so it's just interesting to see how history is continuing all the way to the end. And we just have to, we have to have to see it and not be distracted because there's going to be a whole bunch of redirections like oh yeah look over there look over there look over there but we don't have to worry we could what we need to do is walk in righteousness we need to teach what the scriptures teach and we need to not be fooled when we look at prophecy you know because he says let no man deceive you oh yeah how true we're not going to be deceived after this <laughs> all right sister lisa shabbat shalom shabbat shalom man um I hope I can articulate this um, well because um, I don't do this part very well, but I'm not sure if everyone, anyone is aware of the, um, the Noahide laws, which is where I believe that the, uh, the, Israeli, the, the Israeli Zionists are uh, a part of. Um, and these laws basically are, um, there's seven laws. They're called the Noahide laws. And I think that this, they believe that these are the laws that the Jews, not Jews, but the, uh, 
Gentiles are bound to, which would be us, and that they feel that um, the laws that they are bound to are basically the Ten Commandments, the, the 613 laws. And these laws have been um, passed by Congress, and basically these laws are upheld by um, uh, death by guillotine. So I believe that these laws that came from uh, uh, the Zionists, um, there are seven of them, and that these are going to be what we as believers are going to be, I uh, guess, uh, beheaded by um, that that law. And also on our books, I understand that the Sunday law is also on there too. And I don't know if you are familiar, if you can further expound in, in a more articulate way than I have. Honestly, I think you did a good job. <laughs> uh, that's the way I understand it as well. And I am familiar with that. Um, I would have to say, you know, our, our Congress has adopted these things and then when they start to institute them, whenever that might be, it very well could be, you know, tied together with all of this because it's all in conjunction, it seems. But of course, that one that you're talking about it is originating from the Jews, if you will. So thank you for that, Sister Lisa. That was good. Uh, can I say something? Um, sure. So the Noahide laws are... Do not deny Elohim, do not blaspheme Elohim, do not murder, do not engage in illicit sexual relations, do not steal, do not eat from a, a live animal, and uh, create a legal system of justice. Those are the Noahide laws. Those are not laws that's against the Torah, those are laws that's, that's actually those who follow the Torah will actually promote those things even better than just, you know, Gentile, you know, the idea that they have, which is this is the Gentiles. Now, what they said is that this is what the Gentiles need to follow. There's nothing wrong with those laws. But it says that Gentiles are not supposed to keep the Torah. That's another thing that the Zionists are teaching right now, or the of these whoever these these guys are that that actually promote their teachings of the Talmud. So the Noahide laws are Talmudic, and um, yeah, the the United States adopted these as well as many other moral based laws from their religions, you know, which is what every pagan nation is trying to do right now, which is their amalgamation between each other. Those are not any problem with us. They can't force us to not blaspheme. We won't blaspheme. They won't can't force us to not steal or commit. They can't force us to do those things. We already do those things because we keep Torah. What they're telling us to do is that we cannot keep Torah. I saw a couple of religious um, Jewish leaders saying that it's unlawful to death to keep Torah. So I see that they're uh, perpetuating this idea. I don't think that that idea will make it that far, but the but how they how would they get you not to keep the Torah? The, throughout history is the same way. Even the Rome, like when Rome made laws about Easter and Trinity and Sunday, why did they make laws about Sunday and Easter in them? Because they were keeping Passover and Shabbat. You can't change the Shabbat if you wasn't keeping the Shabbat. So what was happening? They were they were forcing the people to become lawless by changing Yah's laws. So Daniel chapter 7 talks about that they will seek to change times and laws. It was talking about Yah's laws. That's the thing that they changed. You see the Roman Catholic Church, what did they do with the second commandment? I think uh, Brother Rick mentioned it in the study. They took it out so they could perpetuate their, you know, their idolatry. So how do they make you lawless? How do they make you not keep the Torah? By enforcing other laws that's contrary to those things and making you afraid and making you compromise. So what did they do? They kept the Shabbat. So they made a law for Sunday. And then if you don't keep the Sunday law, um, and I think Sister Lisa mentioned the Sunday law, which is also in the United States government, is, and you can look it up, it's called a blue law. So it's called a Sunday blue law. There's some states now that on Sunday, everything is shut down except for essential businesses such as pharmacies and things like that. But there's blue laws where if you work on Sunday right now, you get a fine or you get thrown in jail. You know, so 
I think in uh, some parts of Jersey, there's some towns that has blue law. You know, there's blue laws all over the United States already. It's just not a federal national law yet. Um, but I think that a lot of things are going to become more tight, especially with this coronavirus making everybody think that these this government is our savior, trying to save us from the coronavirus. You know, when Yah says, if you keep my commandments and you follow me, that I'll keep all these diseases from you. You know, so we need to we need to look at the, the the clarification and i don't deny what sister lisa said like that they are a part of all these other this crap that's gonna be against us you know um but the noahide laws when we look at it in its nature like it doesn't really go against those who keep the torah it's just them restricting us to keep the torah that's a problem to them but the they can't make any laws for us not to keep it but our country can and they're going to uh, go ahead, brother Rick. Gotcha. Sister Lisa, you got your hand up. Go ahead and I'll get, let you respond. And I'm coming to you, Toby. Okay. So the part that, um, and it, and it doesn't show, you know, um, uh, initially, but I guess if you go in and you start doing a deeper study on the first two portions of it, it speaks of, um, because the, uh, the Zionists basically do not believe that we are allowed to use uh, Yahuwah's name. And that is part of what they consider blasphemy is if we do use his true name. So I think that's where that comes in and ties in for us as true believers. Um, and then also, you know, the Sunday law too. So I just wanted to add that part. Yeah, I've heard that too. Right. right. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, they also are against the Trinity. <laughs> they are like, a, again, matter of fact, I saw a couple um, I, I, here now and then I try to keep up with what different people are saying and, and what they're using the scriptures to try to prove. And uh, there's, they're, they're like over there, they're against the belief of the Trinity to the point of saying that they have more in common with Islam than they do with Christianity, you know? So, um, black, they, they think the Trinity is blasphemy. So you see the disconnect there as, as well, you know, but you still see the compromise politically. Yeah. But religiously, they, they're not, there's two, you know, it's just like the Pharisees and Sadducees. When you look at the scriptures, you'll be like, why are they so caught up with not taking the money that they gave to Judas to betray Messiah illegally? Like you just broke the Torah by bribing someone to betray someone to trial him unlawfully against the Torah, and then you're so caught up with not taking the money back because it's unlawful. You see, you see the mindset. Like, how are you so caught up with doing something lawful while doing something unlawful? This is how they think. But there's a man that's just straight up lawless. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two said he's going to call himself Elohim. He's going to stand in the temple of Elohim like he's Elohim. You know, so there's a difference between, you know, false righteousness and straight up lawlessness. Yeah, they're both both there. They're both in sin and they're both wicked. But uh, there's a restriction that the that the Zionists give themselves for no reason. And it's called their tradition. They would die because they didn't wash their hands you know, before a meal, like they would die for those, those traditional things, you know? So it's just like the, the, the kamikaze, like they would kill themselves to promote a false idea, you know? So there's many false ideas that people would die for, but when you have one that's completely lawless, everybody can get to the kingdom. Everybody is Yah's people. Everybody. That's the, that's, that's a message to the whole world. Let's, let's become one religious group you know so but i i agree all of the all the things sister lisa said will be involved in the political aspect of this amalgamation of everything you know because like i said rome will adopt whatever the jews say in order to control the jew the zionists they uh, sorry not the jews they would they would adopt whatever the zionists said to control the zionists they will adopt whatever the muslims say to control the muslims just like they've controlled every nation by adopting everything that they do you know, they've controlled Rome by uh, adopting Roman policy, you know, so um, they're very smart. Uh, go ahead, brother. What you say, Rick? Is that Chrislam? 
There's Say a, that again? There's a movement out here called Chrislam. Chrislam. Oh, yeah. Right. Where they're yeah, where they say that. Um, they say that the Catholic Church created the Islamic, uh, the Islamic belief, which there's, it's, there's a chapter in the Quran only about the, the, the greatness of Mary, you know, Mother Mary, they call. So it's, it's pretty interesting when you see that, that correlation. And Muhammad's teacher was a Catholic priest. His we'll teacher figure. was a Catholic priest and his wife was a, was a, I think was a witch, you know, so, crazy. I mean, of course, of course you can see Islam, you know, his teacher <laughs> is, when you look at history, it's just real. And it's funny how Muhammad's teacher was a Catholic priest and how everything goes back to the Jesuits and bringing it back to Rome and Rome is bringing it back to Babylon, you know, so, There's that but yeah, definitely Zion is so involved. Oh well, yeah. All right, Toby, you're up. Are you there? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. I, I, I just um, I had a question, but uh, Jay answered it, and uh, everything's all good now. So, yeah, I just forgot that my hand was still up, so I took it all down. So. All, good. all good. Thank you, brother. All right, Ina. Shabbat shalom to you. Shalom. How are you? Good. How are you today? I'm doing well. Um, um, I was just going to echo everything that um, who was just speaking. Every time he said something, I look at his name. But then when I get ready to say it, I'm like, oh, what was his name? Brother Jadiel. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Jadiel, yes. Yes, Brother Jadiel. I just wanted to echo in agreement everything that he uh, has already said about um, Mystery Babylon. I mean, pretty much 100% agreement with all of it, all of those things I've also studied out um, and more. So I have a lot of information. I actually got off to decide specifically what I'm going to say and what I'm not going to say because I don't want to be overwhelming um, because I know we've been on for a while yes. and you don't want to like over, over overload yourself with information because it's quite a bit when you get into the study of um, understanding the scripture prophetically and seeing it play out right before you. Um, I did want to add on a couple things. First of all, I wanted to make a point about the Gregorian calendar is used worldwide for business and legal reasons. And so you can look that up. That's a provable fact. OK, and if you know history, which is very important with understanding prophecy and understanding scripture, because scripture has played out through history. It's Yah's story of how everything is going to play out. That's why he gave us scripture so that we as watchmen on the wall can watch what he said manifest. All right. As well as we as his people could gird ourselves and really understand how to do what he says. It's, it's a manifold purpose to scripture, but it's hard to understand scripture if you don't look in history. So I like the fact that um, the brother is giving a lot of historical information. And I wanted to just point that out first and foremost, that the Gregorian calendar, which is a deception. And that's what I really want to talk about, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about it too much. It is used worldwide for business and legal reasons. And that's a problem within itself, because if you look at where the Gregorian calendar came from, you can trace it back to Babylon and you can trace that problem in itself back to scripture, back with the people of Yah falling. And I'm going to leave it right there as far as them beginning to not keep Shabbat and them beginning to um, have their own feast days and all these things like that. Um, other than the ones that he ordained. But I also wanted to talk about the Chagma because Chagma is C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A, -A -A, which is G5480, which is the mark of the beast in scripture. But there has been, because to me, I look at scripture and there's, there's, there's fulfillment and fulfillment and fulfillment of it. You know, there's a buildup that has happened. And so Rome um, was one of the earlier nations to actually introduce the, the Chagama. Chagama is a Greek word, but um, Roman slave markets with people wearing clay tab tablets around their ne neck to identify them and their owner and their labor um, was once worn. Um, this identified slaves and it gave citizens at that time as well. So it did identify slaves, the Chagama. It identified slaves and it identified citizens and gave them their eligibility for benefits 
um, and even put the burden on them for their liability for taxes in Rome. Now think about what happened with us, with our social security number and all these other different things. And I'm not implying that that is the marking as of itself. I'm, in, I'm telling you that that's the way the system rolls, that, that marking, that numbering, that, that I got to keep everybody accountable that the Satan does to his system. Um, and so in, in the Roman times, again, the benefits of the people as citizens and even their tax liabilities was connected with their chagma. Um, it was often done, like I said, on that clay, pack, clay plaque, and they called it the chagma. Um, and this can also be relevant when we're looking through scripture with um, understanding the beast, the mark, and the system. Because the mark is a representation of servitude to a system. Um, and we, of course, are already in servitude to the governmental kingdom authority of Yah. So when he was tying in Mystery Babylon and saying the whole world as well is already coming together in um, kind of like a, a commencement <laughs> to, to, to worshiping this beast, that's, that's definitely happening. And um, I'm, I'm just going to stop right there as far as with what I wanted to share. I just wanted to point out the chagma and um, the numbering system and how all those things are interrelated with, with Rome. Um, as well as with the pagan calendar system, because that's a big one. Um, as I stated, the whole world pretty much uses the Gregorian calendar um, for business and legal reasons. Now, I'm not telling you they're not other calendars. Um, per, per my research, there are seven major calendars in regular current use around the world. Of course, the Gregorian, then you have the Chinese, the Hebrew, the Islamic, the Persian, and the Ethiopian, as well as the Balinese, Pawakan, I guess I'm saying that right, but those other six are really used for religious and sometimes social reasons, but that Gregorian is a big time dropper on um, business and legal. Also, I wanted to point to some things about a movement that he has identified with the Catholic Church. Um, one important point to put out here is that in 1893, um, there was something called the World's Parliament of Religions that was held right here on the shore of Lake Michigan in Chicago. Um, and it was supposedly a spectacular event among many other congressional world events because it was like an expose of putting all the major uh, religions together in one building praying to one entity. And notice I said praying to one entity. Um, all together. And you can look up the interfaith uh, movement because that is something that is spearheaded by Roman Catholicism. And um, it's real interesting because I, I actually went into watching some videos with um, them having it. And they had Wiccans there. Uh, they had Druids there. They had Goths there. They had so-called Christians there. Um, and they had Jews there. They had Buddhists there, and then they all would sit down and actually incantate, or you know, you know, <laughs> I call it call upon um, this this entity where they said we can unify and we're really working together to serve the same God. And of course, we know what that is, but it was interesting to see it play out um, and to know that it has strong roots in this nation. They even teach it in certain seminaries, the interfaith. Um, well, we have yeah. to our time here, sister. I know you got more information, but unfortunately. Oh, no, no, no. That was it. Thank you. Very good. That's very interesting. I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that, but uh, I'm going to have to look into that a little more. So thank you for bringing that up. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody, for your participation. And uh, what, what a study today. And I, I, I'm sure that there's going to be more things that are going to come up as we continue to ponder this. But may you continue to brock you and keep you in all that you do. And may he make his face shine upon you and give you his shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shalom. We pray this video is helpful to your journey in the truth. Remember to be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11, who received the word with all readiness of mind, then search the scriptures to see if what they heard was true. We have studies for the whole family, including children, every week. To learn more, visit assemblyofyahuwah.com. Use the Join tab to express interest in participating. Use the Give tab to help support Biblical Assembly needs. To be notified of new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel.
Trust in Yahuwah with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Much love and shalom.